Good morning, friends. <coughs> uh, this is the uh, Adusat <coughs> live lecture series, and uh, we are running, as you know, uh, a series of lectures on world literature. And uh, world literature is a new concept. It emerged in the 20th century, and it assumed a very straight form straight away. Uh, and uh, we have, you know, now a different kind of a situation in which we can relate with people uh, of other languages, other cultures, other regions other countries. And uh, in this series, we will be discussing literary trends, authors, texts, ideas. And uh, today's lecture uh, is uh, <coughs> on African drama. <coughs> I wonder, I, I, I never knew, you know, uh, about 20 years ago, uh, whether this kind of drama would have existed. But it is there, and it was our fault, it was our ignorance uh, regarding, you know, uh, the development of drama in continents other than Europe or Asia. Anyway, uh, we have uh, with us uh, for this uh, 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 an expert on the African drama, and uh, she is uh, Dr. Payal Nagpal. She has done extensive work on drama, written books, written articles, uh, spoken uh, on, on different aspects of it in conferences. And uh, <coughs> we believe that uh, as she considers uh, African drama from her perspective, that will be of interest for us. So, uh, <coughs> before I request her to uh, give a talk on uh, this particular aspect of uh, African drama, uh, I would uh, tell you friends that uh, we have uh, a toll free number uh, at which you can ring us up and ask questions. You can make your own observations also and uh, for this toll free number is 1-800-110-430 and uh, you can ask these questions at the end of the, uh, near the end of the discussion that is at 9, uh, at, at 10.50. For 10 minutes, we, we give uh, to this, and I hope that you will be able to give your feedback, your, your, your agreement, disagreement, your observations. So, with this, now I uh, welcome Dr. Pair Nagpal to uh, welcome uh, Dr. Pair Nagpal. Please start your discussion. Uh, thank you, Professor Prakash. Uh, today's lecture is actually uh, uh, going to create the basis for a discussion of African drama, which will follow later. Uh, uh, today's lecture will primarily be on 20th century uh, drama and the trends uh, therein. So, um, for instance, uh, when we talk about uh, theatre today, when we talk about drama in any form, uh, how do we understand it? What were the movements in the 20th century that actually led to uh, a creation, a panning out of drama in a certain sort of manner? So that when we talk about, uh, you know, be it African drama, be it any other form of drama, uh, drama from the different, it could be Latin American drama, it could be drama from Spain. So, what are the broad trends of the 20th century against which, uh, you know, playwrights responded in a certain sort of manner to actually uh, realize how is it that they can reflect the understanding of their own country and their own context, for instance, or their own understanding of the world around them in the context of those trends. So, um, and today we'll, we will be looking at some very, very important 20th century trends of drama. So, for instance, when we begin with uh, the early 20th century, in fact, I should say the la absolute late 19th century, turn of the century series, we have, uh, you know, uh, uh, a very important movement that emerges which is called naturalistic drama. So, if you look at the word naturalistic drama, you are primarily looking at uh, the term uh, natural. Now, what do we mean by natural? We mean some the uh, natural generally implies, as is a normal understanding of this word, natural means a natural understanding of things, right. So, um, if you uh, in the sense that you know you see things as they are, as they are naturally so to say. So, uh, at the turn of the century when we uh, uh, kind of uh, begin to understand uh, naturalistic drama, it, it emerges from a movement called naturalism at that time. And, uh, you know, playwrights primarily felt that, you know, it was time now, especially playwrights like Ibsen. Now, Henry Ibsen, a Norwegian playwright, if you look at his works, you realize to begin with, he, he writes in verse and then realizes that, you know, the, the problems uh, of the society or the day-to-day -day issues cannot be expressed in that form. And you need to write in the language of the people, the way they are speaking. And so, the prose form becomes very important. So, there is a discussion of important aspects of people's lives. And um, 
when we talk about naturalism, when we talk about the fact that uh, things are to be seen exactly as they are and uh, uh, put up on stage, so we need to understand that this transformation was then happening at many levels. So let me just kind of explain a few of these because if we are to understand uh, the different trends of drama in the 20th century, then these changes are very, very important. So how is it that the audience is going to be given the impression that what they are watching is real? So um, uh, the stage was visualized in a certain manner. So often the term that's used is, uh, you know, the drawing room scenario and uh, at the level of acting technique also. I mean, if, there, if we can say that there is some kind of a methodology or technique of performance, then there were various schools of thoughts and, uh, you know, for instance, we have uh, uh, Konstantin Stanislavski's uh, uh, way of, uh, uh, you know, thinking about uh, a performance and the idea that uh, there is a kind of truth that needs to be expressed on stage. So these, these two ideas, you know, I mean, emerge in totally different contexts and in totally different, uh, two totally different countries. But there is this emphasis in both to kind of understand performance in terms of, uh, you know, uh, giving the audience the illusion that what, sh what they are watching is real. Which is why there is this notion that when you look at the stage, it's almost as if there is this invisible fourth wall. And uh, this invisible fourth wall is, is a kind of, you know, uh, a division between uh, the space in which the actors perform and the space uh, to which the audience belongs. And the idea being that, you know, um, uh, the audience is watching the, uh, the, the scenes on stage as if they are happening in real life. So, um, where of course uh, we need to understand this historically that, you know, this kind of a movement coming at the end of 20th century and responding to drama before it uh, was absolutely, uh, you know, uh, cutting edge and it was, it was radical in lots of ways because uh, it, it formed a deep connection between uh, the, the play that was being performed and the lives of the audience. Yet, when I say this, one must also keep in mind that it had its limitations. And what were these uh, limitations, uh, so to say? So, when we look at, uh, you know, the, the strengths of this particular movement, so for instance, you have, uh, you know, the naturalistic movement and to the novel, uh, particularly the naturalistic novel, for instance, uh, Emil Zola from France has also uh, contributed in a big way. And he had said, and I just uh, quote Zola on this, he says, the future is with naturalism. The formula will be found. There is more poetry in the little apartment of a bourgeois than in the in all the empty, worm-eaten palaces of history. So um, it's interesting that you know now the protagonist is no longer going to be uh, you know people who from the royalty and so on, but it is the ordinary person. It's the bourgeois in this case, and uh, you know we have uh, many theorists. You know Georges Brand who spoke about naturalism and uh, of course Ibsen responded in a big way and said that you know his comments were actually um, uh, you know it was a dangerous text to have in your hands. So, uh, so uh, having understood this as one mentions that you know when we translate this into the kind of plays for instance uh, that uh, were put up. So, if I just take Ibsen as an example then uh, you know a play like The Pillars of Society, Doll's House, Ghosts, Enemy of the People. Now these are plays that actually focused on real issues, on the problems of the people and their lives. So, um, however, it also kind of you know uh, uh, created uh, that divide where the audience remained in its own space and never interacted. I mean today when we actually look at drama, there is a possibility, there is no fixed space. I mean, the, the, the performance can flow into the audience's space and so on. So, um, uh, you know, this is, this is primarily the first part of naturalistic drama that actually then goes on to develop into uh, uh, different kinds of strains. For instance, uh, you know, we, we've already uh, had a theorist like Freud talk about, uh, you know, the, the individual and subjectivity. So, the use of the dream sequence, for instance, and Strindberg does a very good job of it in uh, plays like Miss Julie. And uh, we also have, uh, um, you know, a playwright called uh, Pirandolo. And Pirandolo talk, talks about, uh, you know, uh, for instance, the title of his play is Six Characters in Search of an Author. 
So, you know, how, what would happen when the text itself is kind of broken up? So, when we talk about subjectivity, we're talking about it at multiple levels. When we talk about fragmentation, it's happening at multi multiple levels because even the text is no longer a consolidated text. And uh, when we look at it in, in the context of performance, so moving on from the drawing room scenario, uh, the stage two is divided into various levels. Uh, so, uh, you know, the term self-referentiality becomes very, very important here. And uh, here I would, uh, you know, request uh, Professor Prakash also to share his views on naturalism and naturalistic theatre. Uh, <coughs> Dr. Pal Nagpal, I believe that uh, there is a kind of background to uh, what is written in African drama <coughs> and that uh, that background is required. And uh, I also believe and I agree with you that uh, this kind of naturalistic uh, drama emerging in Europe became a point of inspiration for, uh, you know, depiction of African life, you know, African society. And uh, since African society would not be visited by uh, kings and queens the way <coughs> European society would be, then uh, this naturalist drama that you describe would focus upon the real language of the people, real situations of the people, and uh, the, the uh, background, the similarity and the gap between these two cultures would emerge a little more concretely. So, is, is that the case and, uh, uh, you know, uh, there are of course uh, writers from uh, Africa who would be going to uh, England and who would be going to uh, America in the uh, 20th century and they would be learning all these trends theoretically. So, that when they come back to their country, when they think of the stage, then they take those influences and start, you know, developing their own kind of drama. And uh, they, there also would be, a, I think, a kind of gap between the drawing room situation that you talk about. Drawing, drawing room situation, as you rightly say, is the situation where people behave at the level of culture, where they sit and talk, where they, where they have uh, coffee, they, where they, they have a kind of chit chat, they talk about each other in simple terms. And that finally emerges a kind of description of their mental states uh, in the ideological sense. So, I, I was thinking about these points and uh, maybe I thought that, uh, you know, uh, this background that you have very rightly given uh, to, the, to the drama in the African continent uh, would uh, affect the middle classes in Africa and there, you know, uh, the, the drama will take shape of a different kind. What do you suggest? <coughs> uh, no, actually, as I mentioned right at the beginning that this lecture is going to be primarily on 20th century uh, drama trends mm -hmm. and, uh, uh, you know, I mean, we can only um, uh, maybe, uh, you know, in the next lecture talk about African drama because it's important to understand 20th century mm -hmm. uh, drama trends before mm -hmm. we actually uh, move into a discussion of African drama because what is it that, you know, uh, how, how is it that you know, against what is considered to be the normative, how is it that in the African context, you know, certain trends are then evolved. For instance, if we have to understand uh, what Googi is doing, you know, the way he's moving from, let's say, his early play to a play like I will when marry when I, start writing, when I, uh, uh, I will marry when I want, and mm. he's also writing in the 20th century. So, I mean, before we actually uh, move into a discussion of all that, today's lecture is primarily going to be only on 20th century drama trends because, you know, moving from naturalistic drama to epic theater to uh, an understanding of uh, existentialist drama and theatre of the absurd. That would be the primary thrust And today. that would help us connect with the uh, ideological cultural scene in Africa toward, towards the end. Uh, no, uh, today uh, we will we will concentrate only on the 20th century so that, you know, in the next lecture uh, we basically focus on Africa and uh, primarily Googie and Volshoinka for instance. Mm. So. Um, <laughs> Uh, you know, uh, for instance, when we talk about uh, moving on from naturalistic drama, when we move on to the next part, uh, which is going to be what we call epic theater. So, there is a new strain that emerges there. And, uh, you know, for instance, when we look at a very, very important playwright of the 20th century, uh, and today we are primarily talking about theories of drama. Uh, you know, how are these theories of drama emerging around this time? So, the stress is more on theories of drama rather than playwrights. Uh, so, uh, Bertolt Brecht, for instance, and epic theater. So, what is really speaking epic theater? So, the idea that there is a scientific, rational approach and uh, it is a kind of theater that, uh, you know, I, I wouldn't say it goes against emotion, it allows you to analyze everything. So, what really speaking is, uh, you know, the context of uh, epic theater. So, you know, for I'll quote Raymond Williams here, you know, he says that uh, it is a kind of dramatic form in which men were shown 
in the process of producing themselves and their situations. So the idea that we are no longer thinking in terms of uh, you know a kind of uh, illusionistic uh, theatre that gives us the impression that whatever is happening is happening for real. On the contrary, uh, we have a dramatic form in which people are shown in the process of producing themselves and their situations. So the idea of a kind of dialectical form is very, very significant. And the fact that, you know, uh, uh, you know th this becomes a very crucial point of difference, actually, really speaking, between naturalistic drama and uh, epic theatre. So uh, th the whole idea, and, you know, even uh, Walter Benjamin, when he explains uh, uh, the idea of epic theatre, the notion of interruption that he uses. So that becomes very, very important. So when we try to understand epic theatre, uh, it becomes important to actually uh, see how it absolutely is uh, totally different from, let's say, naturalistic theatre. And when we talk about epic theatre, and if, if we are to talk about, uh, you know, theatre in Africa as we will in the next lecture, so the, the idea is that it, it pans out and we see how these ideas become very, very important, how uh, a construct uh, such as that of epic theatre allows you to actually uh, understand um, yourself and uh, you know uh, the way you are going to put up a performance on stage. So uh, uh, you know as uh, we when we talk about naturalistic theatre there is an emphasis on uh, the audience for instance relating to what is happening on stage and saying that well yes I too have felt like this and there is this notion of a cathartic effect almost at the end in dramatic theatre. There is an epic theatre. The, there is uh, the, uh, the space to actually understand what is happening, to ask questions, to look at multiple possibilities of responding to the same situation, uh, which is not there earlier. So, which means uh, that uh, in the naturalistic theatre, the shade and reflection of life is given. And in epic theatre, people are shown in action, that they are shown in the process of thinking. And they hold dialogues with one another. And through that, they form an understanding of their own. Is uh, that yes. the difference? Yes. So also, <coughs> but when we say shade of life, um, mm -hmm. uh, for instance, epic theatre uh, absolutely shows people who are acting, who are performing, who are doing certain, uh, who are performing certain jobs or contributing to a society in a certain way. Compelling so people to compelling think. Compelling people to think. Mm -hmm. And uh, whereas in naturalistic theatre, the emphasis is more on, you know, kind of identifying with what is happening on stage and leading to a kind of, you know. You mean uh, audience is simply sitting and watching when a naturalistic uh, theatre is presented. But in the case of epic theatre, the audience is taking active interest in what is going on the stage. Absolutely. Is, is that the case? Yes. And mm -hmm. uh, when we talk about naturalistic theatre, the idea is that, you know, the, the spectator almost becomes like a passive entity. Mm -hmm. Whereas in uh, epic theatre, the spectator is an active performing entity. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, in, in Brecht's, uh, Brecht's epic theatre, uh, there is no divide as such of, you know, the space of the uh, actors or the space of the audience. Mm -hmm. It's all together. Why, why do we call it epic? So, uh, if, if uh, we are to actually analyze this term, epic theatre, again, this whole notion of performance, this whole notion of people uh, uh, doing certain things mm -hmm. and uh, uh, the idea that there is no kind of linearity to things. There are these episodes that are connected. There is no... Um, uh, what shall I say, essential plot line that one can deduce from it. Mm -hmm. I mean, if we go back to uh, the time when we look at the epics, uh, the structure of the epic itself, mm -hmm. how there are these loosely constructed stories that are kind of, bi you know, bound together mm -hmm. to generate uh, the epic. So, when structurally, When I think, of, hmm, when I think of the epic, I think of Ramayana and Mahabharata, I yes. think of Homer, Iliad, Odyssey. And uh, these uh, texts were composed, if at all they were composed, in, in the sense in which we understand the term, uh, 2000 years, 3000 years, 4000 years ago. And those tales that people heard, then they were shared by the bard with the audience. Yes. So that was epic theatre, uh, epic uh, poetry at epic that point poetry. of time. Yes. Uh, but in today's context, then somebody called Brecht, as you rightly pointed out, thought of those arguments and mm -hmm. said that uh, the community which al always heard the stories at that time, that community is assumed to be the community today also. And they will take active interest in theatre the way they uh, at that time visualized actual human beings uh, being shared in description by the, by the poet. So that, that perhaps gives the term epic to 
theater. Because epic and theater are two different things. Yes. Epic is song, epic is a kind of poem, theater is presentation. But here, the, this coinage is very important. And as you very rightly said that, you know, epic is sung and so on. So, all these elements mm -hmm. that are there, uh, you know, in epic poetry, for instance, mm -hmm. are uh, pretty much, you know, uh, connected very well with the, a new dynamic in theater, mm -hmm. where uh, songs, a kind of chorus, um, as I said, the structure itself, all these things are used to create a new system in theatre, mm -hmm. whereby, uh, you know, it is more, uh, it is of course extremely performative, it is uh, a space where, uh, you know, there is no rigidity about a kind of division, there is mm -hmm. no dividing line mm -hmm. and the most important aspect of epic theatre and where it is very, very different from naturalistic theatre is that it is participatory. It mm -hmm. is participatory not only in the sense of an audience kind of, uh, uh, you know, coming up on stage and participating, mm -hmm. but participating in terms of thoughts, mm -hmm. in terms of asking questions, in terms of responding to what they are watching on stage. So, if they are watching people who are, um, you know, people in action, mm -hmm. then the audience is able to kind of relate to, uh, you know, I mean, uh, is able to ask questions about the kind of work that they are doing. And getting answers and uh, those answers are, uh, you know, generating debate still further. Yes. So, that finally, they make a kind of cohesive understanding of the society in which they live. Yes. And mm -hmm. it's not as if everybody is going to have the same answer, mm -hmm. unle uh, unlike, you know, maybe, uh, let's say, naturalistic drama, which will push for a kind of, you know, linearity there. Mm -hmm. But uh, that is not the case in, uh, you know, epic theatre. Mm -hmm. So, uh, the the idea, and Walter Benjamin says that, you know, Bresh is talking about basically a kind of relaxed audience and action that is without strain. So, um, so, uh, this is happening somewhere, uh, you know, I mean, I mean we, l we look at a lot of uh, Brecht's plays written in the 1930s and these are very, very turbulent mm -hmm. years. These are years of the World War mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, so uh, just at the brink of the Second World War, this becomes a very important uh, aspect, this becomes a very important point to kind of uh, deal with and which is where, uh, you know, uh, Brecht also uh, puts forth the idea of uh, the parable form, the idea yeah. that, you know, uh, a kind of crisis that is there in society can be told in the form of a simple tale, in the form of a simple story. But the simplicity is in terms of communication, the simplicity is in uh, terms of, uh, you know, the style of performance. But uh, uh, when, it, when it comes to, uh, you know, uh, asking questions and responding to that, these are very, very complex ideas. So, um, when we also, you know, around this time, if we actually look at it, uh, there are these different, uh, when we talk about the naturalistic strain, it, it kind of, that, that la thread moves into different movements, uh, you know, that are put up on stage. So, uh, you know, there's expressionism, there's a use of symbolism, but uh, a very a significant moment is again, when Sartre and, uh, you know, um, uh, existentialist drama becomes very, very important. So, um, we, we realize that, you know, one is uh, a kind of drama that allows, uh, you know, the uh, uh, actors and audience to kind of relate in one sort of manner where the audience is only, uh, uh, res you know, kind of trying to identify with the situation. Whereas with epic theatre, we have a different, totally different style where the audience is trying to actually ask questions about the world that they live in. And it is the world to which the, the actors and the audience belong. So, there is a kind of sharing that happens at that level. Well, friends, uh, <coughs> in this first part of the lecture, uh, we have uh, discussed two important points. Dr. Bayar Nagpal introduced and elaborated those points. One point uh, concerned the naturalistic theatre that emerged in the later half of the 19th century and uh, become, became quite popular in the first quarter of the 20th century. And then she said that uh, this was not enough to meet the requirements of the dramatic audience and therefore a new kind of drama emerged in the form of what she called epic theatre. And then she explained that also to, to our advantage. So, uh, now we come to the end of the first part and uh, in the second part the discussion will go still further to, you know, give this background of uh, 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 drama in general so that that can later on be applied to. Uh, you know, other languages and cultures. Thank you.
Friends, welcome back to the second part of the lecture in which this discuss discussion will continue uh, on the uh, drama in, at, at the world level and uh, in general so that you know different aspects of drama that affect our life and uh, express our culture are discussed here. So, for the rest of the discussion, I request Dr. Pahar Nagpal again to please continue. Dr. Pahar Nagpal. So, uh, in the first part, we discussed uh, naturalistic drama and we discussed epic theatre. And uh, uh, now we are going to discuss two uh, different forms. Uh, one is existentialist uh, drama and the other is uh, theatre of the absurd. So, uh, when we uh, and we, we, we are then going to try and look at these as different kind and these are strains that uh, in drama that emerge from movements that emerge from different countries, but it is not as if they are restricted to that country. So, you know when we understand world literature, it is important for us to uh, look at uh, a lot of these ideas and a lot of these movements in terms of the way uh, there is a kind of shared uh, collaborative way of uh, you know taking it forward. So, uh, existentialism as an idea is uh, something that uh, we have already discussed in uh, a previous lecture. So, here uh, you know when we look at existentialist uh, crisis and how that crisis is expect uh, is uh, expressed in uh, drama is expressed on stage it it is uh, very interesting to mark this. So, for instance man simply is is what Sartre says not that he is simply what he conceives himself to be, but he is what he wills and he conceives himself after already existing as he wills to be wills to be after that leap towards existence. So, man is nothing else but that which he makes of himself that is the first principle of existentialism. So, first and foremost we take this idea uh, you know of uh, existence from Sartre's idea of uh, existentialism the idea that existence precedes essence the fact that this is the basic underlying principle of existentialism and of course, we have already discussed earlier a kind of free will and so on. So, when we actually look at all these ideas uh, that are put uh, put up in the context of theatre. So, there are plays uh, by playwrights like uh, Sartre, Jean Paul Sartre who writes a play called No Exit and uh, you know he writes this in uh, 1944 and uh, if you look at the three characters you know uh, there is uh, Joseph Carcin, there is Ines Serrano and there is uh, uh, Estelle uh, Rigold. Now, they are uh, all three characters are in the same room and they are brought uh, to a room in hell and uh, what is this hell? So, there is this exploration of this idea, the idea that how is it that these people are going to behave with each other and gradually they realize and this is one of the most famous statements that emerges actually from this particular play called No Exit which is that hell is other people is uh, the idea that emerges. So, uh, if you look at it and you know we uh, kind of uh, uh, relate the play to the theory that is already there. So, the idea that hell is other people is something that is kind of you know uh, brought out uh, by uh, uh, the, uh, the, the way in which each person tries to trap the other. So, whether it is Joseph or Ines uh, uh, you know making advances towards Joseph or Estelle. So, each person making advances towards the other. So, how each person becomes a kind of trap and that is what they realize that three people have been put up in the same room it is supposed to signify hell and they keep wondering uh, you know it is in the first half, the half of the play it is almost as if they are constantly raising this question uh, what is hell all about uh, with the realization that they are going to play out each other's hell and with the realization that hell is then other people. So, uh, if you look at it then th there is this emphasis on the individual and uh, you know the fact that um, uh, there is an element of choice and that too is a question that is raised in this play no exit that is there choice and if there is choice how do these people assert their choice. So, uh, in fact we see a very close connection between a theoretical uh, uh, you know basis and enterprise and how that is actually played out in the context of performance. So, uh, this uh, you know is at the heart of uh, existen uh, existentialism per se and uh, when we, we look at it in terms of uh, performance uh, um, I must say that you know uh, this, I mean there are other people who have contributed to this phase, but uh, some plays can be performed, some plays cannot be performed, but here there is a kind of minimalism that 
uh, emerges that Sartre is employing in the play uh, No Exit. So, so and um, what does uh, Sartre mean by saying you know that hell is other people? So uh, it is very interesting as I mentioned that you know in this particular play for instance mm -hmm. there are these three people and it is supposed to the room is supposed to signify hell. So it is not as if they are being tortured. It is not as if there is but any why external. So? Why, why is the room hell? In the, in the 20th century? Uh, no, it is supposed to signify hell is uh, you know the it is it's meant to be these people are dead and mm -hmm. so they have gone to hell. Mm -hmm. So um, that is the rubric that uh, Sartre is used hell for Hell is a play. kind of room, so hell is a kind of close from all sides and where these people are condemned to live together. Yes. And then they carry their own hell inside, so each one's hell. Uh, no. Uh, mm -hmm. Not as if they are carrying their own hell inside. Mm -hmm. In fact, that is the that is what they constantly keep asking themselves that you mm -hmm. know they are not being tortured you know the very conventional cliched understanding of what hell would be. Mm -hmm. And there is a realization that the way each person behaves towards the other mm -hmm. that is what is creating a kind of hell. They have lost the sense room. of humanity there they cannot relate with one another and so they are living in hell. And they are totally self-seeking. Self-seeking, yes. Self-seeking. Mm. So, mm. for e for three people to be together, mm. where the next person is constantly working towards the first, mm. and is is operating in a manner that is totally selfish, is self-seeking, is uh, full of deception. So that's the these are so ideas. Only, only in theory they are together, but otherwise they they have their own individuality, their own selfishness to pursue. Yes. So they remain individuals. Yes. I see. That is existentialism, and that's the 20th century reality which uh, Sartre you know, was struck by. Yes. Okay. And that is mm. where he says uh, that you know hell is other people. The idea mm. being mm. that mm. it is up to the individual then mm. how he kind of operates in the society and this whole element of choice and everything and how at the end of the play you know the door is open but now will he actually be able to mm. move outside of that door. It becomes like a cat situation where they are you know remain they remain there. So, this is a kind of stasis also. But some kind of courage is required to go out yes. and they do not have the courage. Yes. But they have to first take the choice. So, yes. choice becomes important. Choice becomes very important. So, mm. uh, and the fact that you know can they escape it, uh, mm. will they be able to actually um, you know take that step, will any one of them be able to take that step. So, that so that becomes. So, uh, the play is that way kind of uh, will to express oneself in terms of freedom. Freedom. Freedom which is denied to them yes. in the room. Yes. So well, I think that is a very good allegory of the of the 20th century 20th life. 20th century life. Yes. Mm -hmm. So, uh, with this uh, you know uh, we also come to another uh, movement around this time which is very very important and something that is particularly significant in the 1950s where we need to understand that when we look at 1944 <laughs> we are still looking at I mean it is a period that has wreaked havoc because uh, it is the second world war and so on. But by the time we come to the 1950s we are talking about a time period where the aftermath of the second world war is palpably felt. Where people are uh, disillusioned, where people are unhappy, where this idea of the individual who is alone uh, has now changed into an understanding that the individual is now part of a world that is extremely chaotic. So, how does the individual then deal with the chaos and this is where uh, the term theatre of the absurd becomes very important and uh, you know existence no longer makes sense and uh, Martin Eslin uh, you know in, in the famous book theatre of the absurd points out and he says that you know um, uh, you know harmony when we when we talk about the word absurd what does absurd mean? It means out of harmony and it is a term that comes from a music you know the idea of a musical composition. So, the idea that one is out of harmony and he says that you know out of harmony with reason or uh, propriety, uh, incongruous, unreasonable, illogical these are the terms that are used to explain the absurd and this is pretty much uh, the paradigm this is pretty much the predicament of the 20th century. So, th the idea that people are out of harmony with any kind of reason or propriety because uh, the world is shaken up and uh, that people are unsure about themselves, people are unsure about <coughs> the world that they live in. So, this incongruity and you know the, the, the fact that things are illogical become very very important. So, uh, uh, if uh, we look at a playwright like uh, Eugene Ionesco, again theatre of the absurd is a blanket term and you know Martin Essen has of course uh, put in a lot of uh, uh, you know uh, theatre practitioners together. But, uh, he himself points out in the introduction to this book that it is not as if these people actually 
uh, would say that yes, they are they adopted the ideas of theatre of the absurd and tried to uh, kind of implement them. So Martinesson says that you know there are uh, commonalities in them. So uh, of course one uh, might uh, disagree with this, but the, this is the rationale of uh, coming up with a blanket term. Uh, this is Martin Esslin's uh, rationale of coming up with a blanket term that actually uh, uh, in, in, into which you know he kind of tries to fit in all these playwrights. So uh, when we look at uh, Eugene Ionesco and the way he describes the term absurd, he says absurd is that which is devoid of purpose, cut off from his religious, metaphysical and transcendental roots, man is lost. All his actions become senseless, absurd, useless. Now it's interesting to mark because we've already had um, in a previous lecture we've already discussed existentialism, we've discussed the absurd. So um, we realize that the individual is now, uh, you know, somebody who's totally uh, 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 cut off from everything that is around him. So how does in a situation <coughs> where there is no possibility of uh, establishing a kind of bridge? to understand and relate to the world. So how does this individual then relate to uh, the immediate world? And Ionesco very rightly says that he says that you know all his actions become senseless, absurd and uh, uh, useless. So if we actually look at uh, the underlying idea, so uh, Camus has uh, uh, you know um, uh, this the in, in, in the book called The Myth of Sisyphus. Uh, explained, uh, you know, the myth of Sisyphus is, is actually a Greek myth. The idea that uh, Sisyphus is condemned to actually roll uh, a stone up a mountain knowing that, you know, it is going to fall down. So, and this is something that he keeps doing. So, this is a kind of absurd situation. There is no possibility of a kind of leap of faith that will give meaning, but there is an acceptance of the kind of chaos that is there in life. So, uh, uh, Professor Prakash, how would you uh, comment on uh, you know this shift from existentialism to let's say the absurd? Uh, I think uh, the point that you made regarding the World War and uh, the 20th century was that way. Uh, you know, all the time concerned with the, this mass this destruction in the wake of the wars, First World War in 1914 and the Second World War in 1939. <coughs> and uh, after that, you know, whatever people said. I uh, would support their own thesis, but those words, you know, would be uh, making no sense to the audience, to, to the people who heard, heard those words. And they would say that there is a big gap between what mm -hmm. people said and what people did. Mm -hmm. And uh, politics and economics and society all became unreal to the people because they, they were f face to face with death mm -hmm. and destruction. And uh, the, the old world was dying and they were being, uh, that was being destroyed actually. So, uh, 1940, come 1945, when the World War ends, Second World War, after that uh, talking about heroism, talking about uh, rationality, talking about humanism became an empty word mm -hmm. for, for, the, for the middle classes in Europe. So, when 1950s come and you say, then people say all these words are words and they don't mean anything to us. What we, what we require is that kind of freedom which is totally missing in the world. So, that you know gives this uh, sense of void to the people. They don't believe in literature. They don't believe in all the words that we use. Mm. They don't believe in these institutions <coughs> that, that, that govern us, and uh, they are seeking for an answer. And they are so angry. The middle classes of the of the uh, Western world are so very angry at that point of time. Uh, one may not be talking about the uh, colonies then, because the colonies are fighting fighting a different kind of battle. Mm. But so far as the European and and Europe has been leading, you know, all the literary movements so far. So they say that uh, in fact literature itself has become infructuous. It's, it's a kind of a failure and the only answer to the reality is to laugh, is, is, is to crack jokes at the cost of language and all those things. So it's, it's, a, it's a, a direct attack on the supposed limited rationality of literature in the world. So in fact, I think you raise a very important aspect about, you know, what is it that you consider heroic? So heroism uh, no longer has any meaning because, you know, it has led to such uh, widespread uh, destruction. Mm -hmm. So, uh, not only that religion or a kind of metaphysical understanding of the world, but also uh, human values that had been eulogized earlier, mm -hmm. they too no longer have any meaning. Mm -hmm. And uh, in fact, they have totally uh, turned hollow. Mm -hmm. And it is this kind of chaos, this kind of hollowness that creates a situation of absurdity, so mm -hmm. to say. Mm -hmm. And you know, of the individual, if we were to use, borrow from Martin Esslin, this whole idea of uh, you know the uh, uh, of being out of harmony. Mm -hmm. So uh, that's where the individual is then uh, located.
Mm. So, uh, so man stands face to face uh, with, uh, you know, and uh, quote Camus on this. He says man stands face to face with the irrational. He feels within him his longing for happiness and for reason. The absurd is born of this confrontation between the human need and the unreasonable silence of the world. So, if you just look at this uh, kind of, uh, you know, uh, 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 the, the, these two things, one is a human need and on the other hand there is an unreasonable silence in the world, of the world rather. So, uh, because uh, whatever people had held to so far, uh, you know, th they could no longer kind of uh, relate to it anymore. So, what were the uh, kind of, you know, roads ahead, so to say, what were the alternatives? Was there a possibility of actually deriving meaning? Was there a possibility of sense? Uh, so, uh, if you look at it and, you know, and Kabo talks about uh, this uh, quite a bit and, you know, so no leap of faith is possible, uh, no giving up of life is possible, but an acceptance of the chaos is the only possibility. And uh, if you look at uh, playwrights, uh, you know, that Martin Esling talks about and the most famous, of course, being, uh, you know, Samuel Beckett who writes uh, Waiting for Godot. So, you know, uh, the, the con continuous refrain in the play, nothing happens, nobody comes, nobody goes, waiting for Godot, right? And uh, or uh, there is a play like uh, Beckett's Happy Days where there are these two characters, Nag and Nell, and they are in separate bins and they keep emerging from the bins and they try to kind of, you know, uh, make sense uh, of the world, but it doesn't happen. And it's, it's very difficult at that point of time for people to kind of, you know, uh, relate to some of these ideas. So, uh, you know, Camus says that, you know, from the moment absurdity is recognized, it becomes a kind of passion and the most harrowing of all. But whether or not one can live with one's passion is, you know, the whole question as um, Camus talks about it. So, uh, and it is this, this passion that is played out in plays like Waiting for Godot, where there is, uh, of course, a kind of circularity. Uh, Dr. Palna, I would like to ask a question here. Yes. And that question is actually partly answered by you through suggestion. That question is that uh, there is a kind of absurdity in life and people are suffering because of it and they don't have answers. But then the writers come forward and first say that absurdity exists. Right. It is there. And then they start uh, in a way presenting absurdity so that people understand the absurdity around and that you know finally emerges as a challenge to people and to their thinking. So, there is a positive aspect to the sense of absurdity that is presented on the stage. Would you agree with this? Uh, yes, in the sense that uh, it depends how they, uh, uh, how the audience takes to it. So, uh, I would certainly say that, you know, here the writers are performing uh, a function. Mm -hmm. The writers are uh, coming up with these plays to A, describe the situation and to also very clearly suggest that the only possibility is to accept the situation. And they have the courage to, in fact, authentically say that this is the case. Yes. Other people would like to, you know, befool the world and themselves yeah. by, by saying everything is right with the world. Yeah. But the world, if something is not right with the world, then writers come forward and they say there is no meaning in life. There is no meaning in life and the, the uh, only option that, uh, you know, uh, seems to be the viable one mm -hmm. is to accept this absurdity first and foremost yes, yes. and to then think about you know what one can do with it and mm. how one can act upon it. Mm. So uh, I mean the reason I think the playwrights of the 50s are not talking about how one can act upon it is because they are more into describing the situation and to tell the people that you know I mean doing away with this absurdity is not going to help mm. and that there is no other leap, leap of faith that is going to be possible of religion or any other construct. Mm. The only thing is to accept which also kind of you know leads us to understand that what they are really speaking saying is that you have to acknowledge the reality of the world mm -hmm. and the way it is for us to even act upon it. And also stress the need to redefine things because the old yes. definitions now have become outdated. Outdated. And in fact, uh, you know, we, we in, in all these uh, lectures that focus on 20th century movements and trends and, and uh, all sorts of isms, there has been uh, an effort in the early 20th century to kind of break away from movements mm. of the past. By the time we come to the 1950s, we are looking at a phase where this, this break is almost complete in the sense that, you know, new structures have already emerged, new structures have been defined. When we move on to a discussion of uh, theatre from the different continents, then uh, these are trends to which playwrights have responded. Mm -hmm. They have either made use of them, improvised, worked upon them or even rejected them and come up with new ways of 
kind of explaining their own situation. But these have been defining trends in the And new century. ways may not be satisfactory, they but they are definitely new. But they are and definitely and, and uh, people are just showing, you know, that this is what one should do, searching for answers. Uh, search itself is important, even, they, even, even, even when the answers are not given. Mm -hmm. So one at least knows that there are no answers, yes. or there are weak answers only. And it's it's interesting to mark that waiting for Godot, which might not have been understood in certain ways by uh, you know the audience, when it was a play in 1957, a play that was this play was performed to uh, you know 1,400 prisoners in the San Quentin prison, mm. and they could all initially, of course, uh, you know they were expecting a play that would just kind of purely entertain them. But as they sat on and they watched, they were all able to relate to it, and how. Uh, you know, I mean, for them, who is Godot? So they said Godot is society, or uh, Godot is uh, the he is the outside. I would call it a triumph of art. You know yes. that this kind of difficult play was shown to the prisoners, and uh, they, they felt baffled and disturbed, and yes. they started asking questions. Yes. This is a kind of triumph. Yes, it is. Yes. And it, it it is also in the sense that you know already, I mean, even when we talk about the prisoners, then uh, the world is already very uh, you know a very difficult place to be in, mm -hmm. and from there to be able to relate to all these ideas is very very important. So uh, uh, of course, I uh, would like to add one more thing: when politics fails, when religion fails, when cultures fail, mm -hmm. then literature comes forward literature comes and uh, uh, tries to uh, grapple with the questions, if, if not give the answers. Yes. So, where of course a lot of these playwrights are clubbed under, uh, as I said, you know, it becomes a kind of blanket term, theatre of the absurd. But there are other playwrights who kind of, you know, make a uh, uh, departure mm -hmm. from this. Mm -hmm. So, for instance, uh, when we talk about the absurd playwrights, there is, you know, a kind of uh, uh, manner in which certain ideas are presented. And to my mind, uh, the French playwright Jean Genet uh, comes, who I think uh, does not uh, kind of, you know, fit into this absurd paradigm. But he, he creates his own kind of uh, uh, structure of drama that is able to actually, uh, uh, you know, discuss the uh, evils of the society, discuss the established structures of the society mm -hmm. in a certain sort of manner. So, uh, when we look at, uh, you know, the broad 20th century trends, uh, that we have moving on from uh, naturalism to let's say uh, you know theatre of the absurd. It's it's a long uh, you know a, a road that we have travelled, and uh, one realizes that uh, from uh, you know uh, an effort to kind of relate to what is happening on stage to uh, uh, you know expressing a kind of interiority, be it through the dream sequence, be, be it through what is called self-referentiality. Uh, we move on to, uh, you know, the existentialist crisis and we move on to theatre of the absurd. But there is another strain that is absolutely running parallel and is running right through the 20th century and that is of radical political drama. And if we look at it in this sense, then we have uh, theatre of the kind that Irvin Piscator did, we have uh, uh, epic theatre. And uh, of course, uh, you know, if you look at it in the context of India, the entire IPTA movement is around this time. So, uh, and um, I'm sure the different continents have different kinds of movements. So, everybody need not be, uh, let's say, focusing on interiority or subjectivity. Wherever there is a reason, there is a cause, people are also reinventing and are coming up with new ways of, uh, you know, expression. So, uh, but these are, uh, you know, uh, trends that are defining trends. And uh, here, uh, you know, uh, epic theatre, of course, stands out as a very, very uh, solid uh, structure of theatre that allows us to uh, explain the world in a very, very different manner. And uh, of course, uh, Bertolt Brecht also kind of, uh, you know, has uh, compiled his ideas in, in, in various forms and a short organum for the theatre. It's interesting that, you know, from uh, the, the idea from the world of music, these these two terms, you know, to absurd to be out of harmony, whereas Bertolt Brecht is talking about a short organum for the theatre, uh, where he expresses this whole idea of, uh, you know, a kind of uh, dialectical materialism that is to be used uh, for uh, the uh, uh, performance on stage and how the actors and the audience are going to then relate to each other. So, uh, uh, here too, uh, Professor Prakash, don't you think that, you know, when we look at these uh, different trends, uh, we are looking at uh, two very uh, different uh, st streams of thought here? Definitely. Now, uh, after the 1950s, when there is a kind of disarray uh, in, in, in dramatic activity, 
when dialogues are not important, when when uh, characters are being uh, you know, looked at with suspicion, when, when drama merges with uh, the uh, passions of the audience, when uh, all this you know is happening, then answers have to be found. Mm -hmm. And uh, towards the end, as you have concluded your lecture, you have uh, talked about those possibilities of radical drama. Radical drama means uh, inv uh, involving the masses, the audience, into the dramatic form. And uh, whatever you know happens on the stage actually is a replication of what might happen in society. So that's the kind of radical drama, and uh, this is taking shape, uh, as you as you suggested, uh, more in the uh, ex colonies in India, for instance. And uh, it, 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 the trend is all over the world. The, the trend is there in Latin America, so far as yes. you know, this uh, uh, political drama is concerned, and uh, in Southeast Asia. And uh, Dario Fo, Dario uh, Fo is a standing yes. example of this. Dario Fo is. Uh, somebody who was able to actually, you know, take all these ideas further mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, whether be it in the form of the traveling troops and so on, a kind of extremely dynamic, flexible form of theatre that he had evolved that, that allowed him to, uh, I think, discuss every possible uh, uh, situation that was there around him as mm -hmm. he understood as, mm -hmm. as a writer. Mm -hmm. Which means the drama then is able to uh, connect uh, one part of uh, reality with the other part, makes them collide with each other yeah. on the stage and then suggest an answer. Mm -hmm. And that answer will be there in the activities and decisions of the audience. It would not be there confined to the, the words that are used by, as you uh, started saying, naturalistic theatre, existentialist theatre and other theatres. Yes. So uh, friends, we come to the end of the discussion and uh, here you know. Uh, we have discussed certain trends of drama and uh, that you know uh, in a way carries the argument that there is a connecting thread uh, you know between uh, different literatures and be, uh, between different dramatic you know uh, presentations and uh, with this lecture we come to the end of the first six lectures that were uh, you know uh, <coughs> devised to uh, give a general understanding of what literature would be at the level of the world level and uh, today the sixth lecture has been given to drama and uh, there is, this is a good introduction, I, I believe, to the understanding of uh, specific aspects that will now be uh, taken up uh, in, the, in, the, in the next uh, lectures uh, every month uh, on a regular basis. And uh, please be prepared to uh, critically examine all that is being said here. And uh, you can agree, you can disagree, you can form your own opinions, you can raise new issues in your uh, specific you know, fields of activity. That is what this lecture series is, is meant to you know, achieve and work for. So, with this we come to the, the, the first part of the introductory series of lectures and this sixth lecture as was given by uh, Dr. Payal Nagpal has uh, raised questions of a different kind than we have been discussing earlier. So, I thank you uh, Dr. Payal Nagpal for this lecture and uh, uh, viewers uh, be prepared to have more such discussions in future uh, and uh, the lecture series will continue uh, on a regular basis. Thanks again.